Okay, and, and while I do a little housekeeping here, let me make sure that's on for you. Um, uh, I do want to point out, in case anybody is starting to have a little uh, uh, anxiety attack, we don't know that it came from this group. It's an iPhone on T-Mobile. We have reason to believe it belongs to a male because it was found in the men's bathroom. <laughs> we certainly wouldn't read your messages, but if there was a message on the screen, on your lock screen, that said, uh, Grandma will be staying with somebody's sister, so the apartment will be vacant. <laughs> if you happen to know whose sister that message is about, this is your phone, and you can come claim it up here. Otherwise, we'll take it to the general lost and found. With that, panelists, got the mics in front of you. Uh, just hit the button if you're going to speak. Give it a little second to make its radio connection, and off we go. Let's start with our first question in the room. Microphone number one, please. Thank you. Oh, that's loud. Uh, <laughs> thanks for your presentations. Uh, my name's Mark. I'm a recovering 505 B2 developer, so we won't get into that. Uh, your presentations raised many questions, and again, I don't want to get into trouble with the moderator, so I had to figure out which is the most important one. I figured I'll ask a practical question. So I was a little puzzled. I know you said uh, this morning, still morning, right? Uh, you won't review protocols in advance. Uh, so the part that uh, I wanted to ask is when we submit our detailed, specific questions in our pre and and we put in our justifications or we raise our issues around those specific questions. And this is for clinical, uh, clinical projects. Shall we also include in that meeting request briefing package a protocol or a synopsis to refer to? Or are we just wasting our time developing that? Because as a sponsor, it also takes our resources to develop a protocol and synopsis in advance. And we'd rather not do it if it's not helping the process. So if you wouldn't mind addressing that. Thanks for that question. I think we can clarify a little bit. Um, what we wanted to avoid is that you can't just send a protocol into the ether and say, review it, because that is obviously a, an assessment task that takes place during the ANDA. However, if you have specific questions about that protocol, um, we you would, you would include that protocol or a synopsis of the protocol to, to give us enough information to be able to address those specific questions that you're asking. So you would want to have it far enough in development that you were pretty sure this was the direction that you were looking to go, and then ask those specific questions to help you fine tune or, or make additional changes. But yes, we, we, we didn't want to give the impression that don't bother submitting anything, because then how could we give you any advice? Um, the, the point that we were trying to avoid is that in the past, OGD has, in the long past, has sometimes accepted protocols and given general advice on every aspect of the protocol. So when you do submit that protocol to us, we are not looking over every single piece of that protocol the same way that we would during a review of an ANDA, because we don't have the time, we don't have the staff necessarily dedicated to be able to do that for you. So while if we're at answering your specific question, if we do come across something else that would be raising a flag for us, we'll point that out to you. But the expectation is that we are not doing that pre-review prior to your ANDA submission. All right. Microphone number two, please. Hi, thank you for the great presentation. I actually have two questions. I'm going to start uh, with one, then okay. I'm going to stand. And then you're going to move to that microphone over there? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, in the PSG for baclomethasone dipropionate, alternative approaches were proposed. So I want to ask, has the ORS performed any research regarding the um, spray velocity evaporation rate, APSD with mouth throat, and the breathing simulation? If so, where can we find those research materials? Thank you.
Thanks for your question. Uh, yes, we have conducted uh, research projects looking into uh, clinically relevant in vitro studies using uh, um, um, several types of maltroth models. Uh, we, uh, if you go to our GADUFA regulatory research website, you will find uh, information about this uh, research projects, some uh, summary of the outcomes, and uh, also a list of uh, publications uh, we have uh, 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 published uh, so far. I think one of the papers came out uh, early this, this year. Um, and also, yes, we also have internal research looking into the PIV method that you uh, mentioned that is currently uh, ongoing. Um, so uh, as soon as we have um, uh, results, we will be working to, to publish uh, that. So my advice is uh, go to our GADUFA regulatory research website, and uh, I'm sure you find all the information in there. All right, online question, please. If a product is indicated for both asthma and COPD, and I need to complete a user interface study, do I need to show that the product works the same in both populations, or will only one of these suffice? Um, additionally, asthma can include children. So if you can comment on that, thank you. So thank you, that's a good question. So in general, if for example you have a metered dose inhaler that is prescribed for both um, adult, uh, older adult COPD population as well as for asthma, which can go all the way down, some of the indications are down to four, um, you, what we usually suggest is when you're looking at that user interface and you're looking at those uh, critical tasks, you would want the critical tasks and those external critical design attributes to be as close as possible. When, if, if and when you find that you may have a difference that might affect an external critical design attribute, and you think that the best way to address that would be with a comparative use human factor study, the, use, the typical path that people take when they get to that point in determining is um, that you would usually want to use the patient population uh, that would be most at risk. We do it as a risk-based approach. So you would want to look at a patient population that would have the most risk from getting it wrong. Now, when we talk about bioequivalence in general, we do not typically recommend if a product is approved for more than one indication. If you're demonstrating bioequivalence with the in vitro uh, PK studies um, and the comparative clinical endpoint study, uh, all of those are done with one population and we usually specify in the PSG which population that is. You do not have to reproduce for every single patient population. Um, again, when you're doing, so if you do feel like you need to do that comparative use clinical factors, human factor study, you would want to see what the greatest risk or which population would be affected the most, and then that would be one of the ways that you would do that. I would also strongly suggest that if you got to that point and you felt that that was important and you were struggling with that decision, that's a great opportunity to reach out for a, um, a, a pre and a meeting request to discuss that with the agency so that we could give you more specific information and feedback about your specific product, your specific risk profile, and, um, and hopefully help you with that development question. Okay, microphone number one, please. Thank you very much for all very fascinating presentations. I have a question regarding the alternative B approach. I think it's absolutely encouraging, exciting that the agency has finally considered alternative B approach. And we all know how clinical endpoint study or B, uh, P, uh, PD study could be you know, variable, expensive, time consuming, etc. Now, my question is that if you read through your guidance carefully, that you propose uh, this alternative approach, including advanced in vitro, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, for BDP, because it's a Russian-based formulation. But to me, actually, the method you propose, alternative method you propose, advanced in vitro uh, studies, simulation, modeling, uh, dissolution, and uh, uh, alternative PKB studies, these are all very powerful tools. 
actually more powerful tools to differentiate suspension formulation rather than solution formulation. And if the agency considers tools that are appropriate for solution formulation, I think that even more appropriate for suspension formulation. So my question to the agency is that, have you or are you going to consider these alternative tools for suspension formulation also? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so we, uh, we have uh, looked at the, these types of studies for both solution suspensions. However, uh, the studies that we propose here um, uh, do fit better for the solutions currently. And while we are still investigating um, uh, suspension formulations and uh, exploring alternative methods for the, that type of uh, NDI product, at, at this time we don't have um, uh, we, we don't recommend the, the same approach uh, for, for those products. However, I'd like to add that if you feel that you have a product that you're developing and you feel strongly that that could be a method that you would like to uh, recommend or suggest that you are eligible for an alternative approach, that is one of the, the, re the reasons why you can request a product specific, uh, excuse me, a pre and a meeting. So if you feel that you have an alternative approach to what you see in the product specific guidance for that product, that is exactly the reason why you could think about putting that package together. And within that package, the important pieces for you to include would be your rationale and justification as to why you feel the specific studies that you're identifying would be the ones that would be able to characterize the product and cover that potential to be delivered to the site of action. Uh, that were tied to by the regulations. And when you put that all together within your package and you ask those specific questions, that would be something that we could assess in a pre and a meeting. Thank you. Microphone number two. Hi, me again. I think Dr. Zen just asked half of my question too. So this is my question right. 1.5. Um, <laughs> As we find in the guidance, there's uh, really little guidance for the soft mist inhaler. Can we consider using um, suspension PMDI guidance for soft mist inhaler? Thank you. So when we develop product-specific guidances, they are, in fact, product-specific. So usually the recommendations that we make for one is just for that one product that we're identifying. However, a lot of these products are, are related. There are some things that you may find that are similar. Um, and so there may be pieces of certain guidances that would be applicable to other products. However, when we, so because there is no product specific guidance for the product that you just mentioned, I would suggest that that's something that if you had questions about your development program for, that would be eligible for a pre and a meeting, and that you would want to have a product development meeting to discuss specifically which pieces of which guidances you feel are applicable for your product, and how and why, and what your rationale and justification is for doing that. Um, and if you pulled all that together and submitted it with some specific questions, I'm sure we would be um, more than willing to entertain that. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, online question, please. Can you please comment on the difference of information required for a nebulizer inhalation product versus a metered dose inhaler? OK. Uh, OK, so that question, I would just say, first of all, it's pretty vague. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I think maybe what the question is, and I apologize to whoever sent it in if I'm interpreting your question wrong, um, I think what maybe somebody is trying to get at is that for, for, so for solutions that are for inhalation that uh, go into a general use nebulizer, those are usually covered by that instance where we uh, where we talked about the um, where a waiver may be applicable. However, when you have a metered dose inhaler, that becomes much more complicated because now you have a drug device combination product, and the size of the particles that are d delivered that are then uh, taken down into the respiratory tract for to deliver to the site of action. The size of those particles are determined by the um, by the specific details of your device constituent part. How small the particles are, how large the particles are, um, how far those particles are generated. Um, 
all of those reasons make that a very complex decision. So the testing that we need for a meter dose inhaler, even if it's a solution for a meter dose inhaler, may be very different than what we would need for a wet droplet solution of um, something that goes into a, um, that's able to be used in a general use nebulizer product. Okay, microphone number one, please. I just have a quick clarification. With the case study, the ADVED discus, discus um, the difference between the, the RLD and the generic, um, they were minor differences? They were sort of considered minor? And, and if they had been considered other differences, or you know, in, in another case study, we came across other differences, are those you know, can you justify other differences um, with, you know, data that you can submit or you have to go back and redesign? So to clarify, and I apologize if I wasn't clear enough in my presentation, those were determined to be other than minor differences because the question was whether or not it affected those external critical design attributes or not. And then the firm was able to provide additional information or data that helped support the determination that it was acceptable. It require human factors? That difference? That's a specific question about the product that I can't get into. Thank you. Online question, please. When I conduct the labeling comparison for my inhaler, what parts of the label do I need to compare between the test and the reference label? Um, so uh, the labeling comparison is one of the elements of comparative analysis uh, guidance, as Dr. Witzman um, uh, discussed. And at the pre and the stage, we want you to focus on the instructions for use. Uh, what are the critical steps that patients need to uh, conduct in order to administer the, the dose uh, using the inhaler? So that's the part of the the entire full prescribed information that we focus on the pre and the stage. After the application is submitted and then the review, the full prescribing information is going to be assessed. But for um, purpose of pre and the meeting requests, focus on uh, instructions for use. And just to add to that, in the ANDA, um, in the ANDA side, you would still be um, you would still need to be held to uh, 31494 um, A84, which says that the labeling has to be the same as the reference product, except for uh, rare exceptions, one of which is a manufacturing difference. So it would be not just that instructions for use, but all of the labeling that's evaluated at the time. However, for the comparative, um, for uh, comparative analyses, the general focus is on those parts of the instructions that talk about that user interface and how a patient or an end user interacts with that combination product. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left for questions. If you have any in the room, come up to the mic. Let's take another online question. If my inhaled product has more than one strength, do I need to conduct the BE studies for each strength? or can I just conduct them on the highest strength? Yep. This asking about the bridging B studies or pivotal B studies? I didn't quite. That's for the bridging studies. Bridging, OK. So we, OK. So from a bridging study perspective, uh, we prefer to have all strengths that are you propose to change in a test product to have bridging studies conducted. However, um, if you strongly feel that you have some reason that only the high strength or the one or uh, one of the strength that you think is necessary for the bridging study, you can provide justification in your end of submission, and we can take that into consideration. However, again, we uh, strongly recommend you to have a pre end communication with the agency regarding how to conduct your bridging B studies. And uh, this is for the B uh, bridging B study perspective. And for the pivotal bridging study, uh, pivotal B studies, we recommend you for the in vitro study to conduct all, all of the strengths. 
Okay, my phone number one, please. Yeah, my question again is to Dr. Ma. It's about the bridging study, and uh, you mentioned that uh, in vitro BE study would be sufficient to, you know, to support some of the changes. But in some cases, actually, in vitro BE study would be sufficient. You have to do probably in vivo BE study. My question to you is that under what circumstances do you think we should do an in vivo study in addition to in vitro BE study? This is uh, this actually depended on the specific change that you propose, and also based on the in vitro studies that you already submitted in the NS submission. We'll based on uh, we'll evaluate this and decide whether in vivo studies are needed or not. Thank you. Another online question, please. What is the minimum number of inhalations sufficient for PK characterization of a product without a product specific guidance? Do you recommend we use the labeling for maximum inhalations allowable, or should we go with the number of inhalations sufficient for PK characterization using a widely available sensitive analytical method? Yes, for this one, uh, I would say that you'd want to go with uh, um, the minimum number of inhalations uh, depending on your uh, for, for characterizing the PK based on that uh, sensitive analytical method. Another online. Okay. Is it acceptable to perform an in vitro BE protocol on different stages? For example, starting with the first test and first reference batches and continually continuing later with second batches of test and reference. Usually, usually, we prefer these studies to be conducted at, in, within a uh, short period of time. But it, again, if you have reason um, to do so and you have justification that um, this does not impact the uh, B outcome, you can submit that into your end of submission and we can take that into consideration. Okay, if there's any more questions in the room, come up to the mic. But let's go with another online question, please. What type of in vitro BE studies are acceptable for a nasal inhaled drug delivery delivered? For a nasal inhaled drug delivered via nebulizer where the drug where the delivery device is not identical to the reference listed drug. Clarification question. Uh, did that say nasal or did it say nebulized? Can we, can we get a repeat of the entire question, please? What type of in vitro BE studies are acceptable for a nasal inhaled drug delivered via, nebula, via nebulizer where the delivery device is not identical to the reference listed drug? Off the top of my head, to my knowledge, there is no um, there is no reference listed drug approved that is a nasal nebulizer product uh, to which I can that I can think of. Um, so therefore, it's really difficult for me to answer this question. Okay, do we have another one? Let's go with one more online question. This is a, a little easier, <laughs> a general question. <laughs> How can startups get help in early product development, and how can they approach the agency? Are there mentorships for regulatory help besides the SBIA workshops? Are there lists of good regulatory and technical help, or are there more upcoming trainings? OK, so as far as general education, the first place that I would refer um, anybody who's interested to learn more about is to the FDA.gov website. If you go to that website, there are individual website pages for everything, including there's a whole section for generic drug products. There is an entire section talking about all the research that um, ORS and OGD are um, as well as OPQ and some of our other colleagues are involved in uh, that may have potential impact on generic drug products. We have our list of our product specific guidances there which give you information about individual products and the recommendations that we make for bioequivalents for those products. There are, um, you have the ability to go and search through general guidance documents 
um, if you go to the guidances page. Um, and there are enough, I think, enough general guidances for people to get their feet wet. We also publish on the FDA.gov um, website about upcoming training, upcoming uh, uh, conferences uh, in those fields as well. So that's really your one-stop shop if you have any more questions about that. Thanks. OK. And that's where we're going to end the panel. Can you please help me thank the panel coming? And <laughs> Okay, we, we have continued 